So the head of, the, of, of my message this morning, is there a yearning for change? Is there a yearning for change? So over the, after, over the coming weeks while pastors away, we'll be looking at a range of scripture, but we'll stay in around one central theme. And the central theme is change. And look at what you and I um, are required to do to permit God to change, not only our situation, but maybe our lives um, as well as our nation. And I just want to quickly paint a picture of, of where we are. So I think it's fair to say, um, and we can all agree, our nation is in a mess. It's in a mess. Society is in a mess. Maybe our lives and our families are in a mess at the moment. Um, divorce rates are going through the roof. Abortion rates are going up. There seems to be dysfunction around every corner. You know, everything just seems to be upside down. Anything good now is called evil and anything evil now is called good. I don't know whether it's just me or whether I'm just getting old, but it, nobody seems to care anymore. Now, before you start edging off your seat and running out the door thinking, oh, I can't take this. You know, I've had a depressing week. It's a dep honestly, I just really want to encourage your hearts this morning. So just stick with me throughout the message. And honestly, you, you will be encouraged by the end. But I just want to kind of just see exactly where we are, you know, the times that, that, that we're in. So 2 Timothy 3 Verses 1 and 4 says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Well, we can see that. I mean, we went on holidays the other day, and, you know, there's people taking selfies, and, you know, they're doing all this, and people just seem, just nowadays, just to love themselves. Covet us. Well, everybody wants to, you know, everybody wants to keep up with the Joneses. Boasters. Proud. Well, we'll go into that in, in, in a bit more detail. Blasphemers. I mean, I haven't watched the Olympics, but I saw pictures of the, um, of the opening ceremony. Um, and there was, you know, a bunch of drag, whatever, the drag queens, perverts, I call them, um, mocking the Last Supper. And it's blasphemy. That is utter blasphemy to a holy God. I mean, you can't even turn on the TV nowadays without somebody blaspheming or taking the Lord's name in vain. Disobedient to parents. Well, we see that everywhere we go. Unthankful. Now this is this kind of is a bugbear with me so and i need to deal with this because when i'm driving you know when you stop and then you, you obviously you're waiting for someone to come forward and they just they just never wave or never thank you you know they just stick their head in the air and they just keep driving by and oh you know so unthankful unholy without natural affection again we see that everywhere we look truce breakers false accusers incontinent fierce despisers of those who are good traitors heady minded well, that's just described the government. Um, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of good. So we can see, we can say all we want about, you know, we're concerned about the state of our nation. We're concerned about the state of our schools. We're concerned about the state of our families and our friends and all the other things that I've just mentioned. But if we don't take this seriously, um, then nothing's going to change. If we don't yearn for change, then nothing is going to change. We need revival in our land. We need revival in our homes. We need revival in our, in our lives and in our churches. But it starts right here. It starts with us this morning. It starts right here. But you may be thinking right now, oh, brother, it's too late. It's way too late. You know, God is just, God has taken his hand off us. We've crossed the line of no return. But I don't believe that this morning. And the reason I don't believe that is because we're still here. You and I are still here. You know, if God hadn't finished with us, he would have taken us home. So there's, there's still a work for us to do. Amen. So I've, I've entitled this message, Is There a Yearning for Change? So to yearn is, is to have an intense longing for something. Now, I know you've heard this scripture many times, but I believe in these last days, as we've just read, that it's time to revisit this verse. Now, we know this promise was given to Israel, but the scripture says that all of these things happen to them for examples to us. So 2 Chronicles 7.14, as Andy, Andy has read this morning, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So as we go through this verse, we can clearly see all the requirements God has laid out this morning in order for revival. So I'm just going to break it down in three requirements this morning. So if my people which are called by my name. Now if is a small word, but it has huge consequences. So if introduces 
a conditional clause. So right off the bat, we have a choice either to accept or to reject. If my people, which are called by my name. So who is God speaking to? God is speaking to you and he's speaking to me. My people, he's talking to his people. See, many of us look outside for change. You know, we look to the government. We look to certain people in the world, certain people on like social media who have a lot of influence to make a difference. But you know, so many times you put the blame on other people and we point the finger. Oh, it's his fault, or it's her fault, or it's the government's fault, it's so-and-so's fault. You know, sometimes we blame God. Many times have you heard people blame God, it's God's fault. But God is pointing the finger right back at you and I. See, God is not to blame for the mess we're in. We are to blame for the mess we're in. If my people, which are called by my name. So he's talking to the Christian. He's talking to the true believer. He's talking to you and I this morning. 1 Peter 4, 17 says, For the time has come that just ju judgment must begin in the house of God. So if we want change, it starts with you and I right here this morning. It's not going to start in Parliament. It's not going to start in the Senate. It's not going to start in our public schools. It's not going to start with our police force right here in the local church. So the first requirement this morning shall humble themselves. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. So God is saying we must be humble and not proud. See, many confuse humility with weakness. See, humility is not weakness. One preacher um, likened it to a horse, you know, a big horse with a bit in his mouth. So you've got all that strength and all that virility, but it's under control. It's all under control. So we must be humble and not proud. See, pride is at the very top of the list of the things that God hates. We may say, oh, God, God doesn't hate. Well, God hates. If you read your Bible, God hates a lot of things. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 says, These six things that the Lord hate, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a, fault wit a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. I mean, I've been to many churches where there's plenty of discord, discord amongst the brethren. And that's what God hates. But number one, number one on the list is a proud look. See, God hates pride. It was pride that got Satan kicked out of heaven. Pride got Satan kicked out of heaven. It was pride that led to Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed. It was pride that led to King Saul's demise. Society today oozes pride. Everywhere you look, it, it just seems to ooze pride. See, God will not and he cannot bless if we're proudful. So if we're proud this morning, God cannot and will not bless us. James 4, 6 says, God resisteth the proud, but gives grace to the humble. See, if we're proud, God will resist us. And I just, I, I kind of, I don't know about you, but when I read in scripture, I kind of imagine things. And I can just imagine God just, you know, if we're proud, God is just, you know, just holding us back. He's resisting us if we're proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Boy, do we need grace in this day and age. You see, pride is more than a puffed out chest. Pride is independence, where humility is dependence. Now, I'm going to say that again if you want to write that down. Pride is independence. Humility is dependence. Pride says, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Lord, I don't need to rely on you. I'm, I'm good. I just, you know, I can take, take care of things myself. Pride is the unwillingness to wait for God to act in his own time, in his own way. You know, pride rushes out and pride takes matters into its own hands. See, one of the best examples we can find is in, in 1 Samuel 13. Remember when, um, when Saul was going to battle with the, with the Philistines? Um, and Samuel said to Saul, Saul, just, just wait seven days. Just wait seven days and I'll tell you what to do. Now, why the Lord, you know, had to take Samuel away for seven days? Perhaps he was just testing Saul. I mean, that's, that's probably what he was, just testing Saul's, you know, faithfulness and obedience. But anyway, Samuel had to go away for, for seven days. Um, so that's all Saul had to do was just wait, wait, and just get instruction. So I can imagine Saul kind of on the top of this mountain, you know, with all his, with all his army. Um, and the Philistines are gathering. And it says, you know, there's thousands of horsemen and chariots and, you know, all this army's accumulating. 
And I guess o- o- over the seven days, Saul's kind of, you know, pacing up and down. Um, and his men, they, they just, they get faint because obviously they can see all the armies and they're just thinking that they're just going to, you know, outnumber us. So Saul's army, you know, starts, they start departing. So again, Saul starts to get a bit anxious and, you know, towards the seventh day, you know, he's kind of just, oh, where's, you know, well, he obviously was looking at his watch. But where's Samuel? Where's Samuel? He promised to be here. But again, all he had to do was, was wait. And the Lord, had, you know, would not let him down in the past. But anyway, seventh day comes. Saul's waiting for Samuel. He's waiting for Samuel. And he just takes matters into his own hands. He says to the priest, just, you know, bring, bring the offerings. They're sacrificed unto the Lord. And as soon as they sacrificed unto the Lord, Samuel came back. And Samuel said, Saul, what on earth have you done? What on earth have you done? And because of that, his kingdom was taken off him. But all he had to do was wait. All he had to do was wait upon the Lord. So humility is having total dependence on God. Humility is trusting God to do the right thing at the right time in the right way. So the the first requirement is to be humble. The second requirement is to pray and to seek my face. So if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. See, to seek is the desire to find. Remember as children playing hide and seek? Remember we used to play hide and seek when we were kids? Remember if you were the one that, you know, had to go and find them? Remember there was a longing, there was a desire to find those who were hiding. But friends, I tell you today, God isn't hiding. God's not hiding from us. He's there. He's just waiting for us. And if we seek him, we will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall search with me with all of your heart. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See, the problem is for many, they just, you know, they go into prayer or they seek him for a short space of time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And when God hasn't answered, we just, we just walk away. I mean, I've been guilty of that myself. You know, we go to prayer and we seek the Lord and Lord, you haven't answered me. And we just, you know, rather than just waiting and waiting and waiting on the Lord, we kind of just, you know, ready to rush off. So David was a man after God's heart. He cries out in Psalm 27 verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And verse 8 goes on to say, When thou sayest, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. See, seeking God and prayer go hand in hand. But the sad truth is today, many are seeking they're not seeking the face of God, they're seeking the hand of God. I'm going to say that again. They're not seeking the face of God, they're seeking the hand of God. James 4.3 says, Ye ask, and you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. See, when we go to prayer, what are we seeking? Are we seeking God's will, what God wants? Or are we seeking our will, what we want? Now I'm going to say something next that, that might shock you, might shock you a bit. You know, God doesn't hear every prayer. And God, get ang- God gets angry when we pray amiss. Psalm 80 verse 4 says, O Lord God of hosts, how long will thou be angry against the prayer of my people? Because they were praying amiss. They were praying for their own needs and not, you know, for, for their own will and not for the Lord's will. So that's the second requirement. We are to pray and seek his face. So the third requirement, we must turn from our wicked ways. So again, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, we can't have revival without repentance. How can God bless us if we're living in a way or doing things that are contrary to the word of God? So what does it mean to repent? By the way, repentance is used 969 times in the Bible. See, many believe it's just simply to turn around and to go in the opposite direction. But scripture tells us it's much, much more than that. So the word repent is to feel remorse and have self-reproach for our sins against God, to be contrite, to want to change direction. You see, true true repentance um, includes a desire for change. So true repentance includes a desire to change. So did you know that repentance is more than conviction of sin? You know, we can get convicted just like Felix. Remember Felix, when Paul was talking to Felix? He got convicted, but it didn't lead to repentance. And without repentance, it's worthless. Repentance is more than confession. 
of sin. During the plagues, Pharaoh confessed his sin. I don't know if you realize, but Pharaoh actually confessed his sin. But again, it didn't lead to repentance, and it was worthless. Just being sorry doesn't constitute repentance. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, Paul talks about, he talks about a godly sorrow. This godly sorrow naturally produces uh, repentance. That includes a hatred for sin, a righteous fear of God, and a desire to right all wrongs, to turn from what we know is wrong. Ezekiel 14.6 says, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourself from idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. So anything we put before God is an idol. Whether it's TV, whether it's a job, whatever we put before God is an idol. See, repentance is not a half-hearted change. It's a whole-hearted change. This is what uh, Spurgeon said about the need for repentance. I trust that sorrowful penitence still does still exist, though I've not heard much about it lately. People seem to jump into faith very quickly nowadays. I hope my old friend repentance is not dead. I'm desperately in love with repentance. It seems to be the twin sister of faith. I do not understand much about dry-eyed faith. I know that I came to Christ by the way of, weep by the way of a weeping cross. When I came to Calvary by faith, it was with great weeping and supplication confessing my transgressions and desiring to find salvation in Jesus and in Jesus only. See, we don't hear much about repentance anymore. Um, I mean, if you, I mean, some of the, you know, the, the decent preachers that are left, um, they, they may talk about repentance now and again, but very sel seldom do you get a, a message on repentance. See, the first message that Jesus gave was repent. That was the first message he gave. The last message he gave to the church was the same, repent. The message he's given us today is repent. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. So there's three requirements. And if we meet those three requirements, God will. Well, what will God do? God will hear from heaven and forgive our sin, and he'll heal our land. You know, the same God that sent revival to Nineveh and to Samaria, he can do the same today. It's the same God. We serve the same God. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the creator of heaven and earth. There's, there's nothing that the Lord cannot do. There's nothing that he cannot do. Have we gone too far? Has God removed his hand? Again, I, I, I really believe not. Otherwise, we either have taken us home. Why, why are we still here? Because there's still a job for us to do. But time is short. Honestly, time, time is short. We have, we have not, you know, this time, even though it's really short, God is long-suffering, and he's, he's not willing that any should perish. Isaiah 51 says, now again, this is to Israel, okay? But this kind of describes, you know, our Lord. Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement? Whom have I put away? Question mark. Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Question mark. Behold, for your iniquities have you sold yourselves. And for your transgressions is your mother put away. Wherefore, when I came, was there no man? When I called, there was none to answer. Is my hand shortened at all that I cannot redeem, or have I no power to deliver? You see, when Israel turned his back on God, they blamed God for going into captivity. But God's re reply was, you did this to yourself. Where are the divorce papers? There's no divorce. I didn't divorce you. You walked away from me. But God is still waiting. Honestly, God is waiting. He wants to redeem and he wants to deliver. Honestly, God, God wants to do a work with you and I this morning. But it's only if we meet those, those three requirements. See, I told you it wasn't all doom and gloom this morning. <laughs> so just to conclude this morning, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, seek my face and pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. I, I, honestly, I'm tired. I'm tired of the status quo. You know, I'm tired of looking at, you know, filthy perverts on, uh, on pictures, you know, mocking our Lord and Saviour. Honestly, I'm tired of um, men, mentally ill people, people killing, you know, children up, up in Southport, you know, a few weeks ago. I, I, that's why I really don't listen to the news because it is all doom and gloom. Um, I, I, I'm just tired of it. I'm absolutely tired. I'm tired of living in a, um, an entitled woke society. 
I mean, everywhere you look, you know, everyone's entitled. I was talking to my neighbour yesterday, um, and he was saying that one of his, um, he's doing a bit of work for us, and he said, oh, sorry, it's been a bit long, because one of his workers is off on the sick, um, and he's got a drug issue. But he said the government are now giving people um, handouts to kind of, you know, um, promote their the, the habits. So if, so if you're a drug addict and you go to the, um, to the social security, they will actually, actually give you money to, you know, to feed your habit. The same as if you're an alcoholic. If you're an alcoholic, you go to the social security and they will literally give you, I don't know what it is, 20, 30 pounds a week to feed your habit. Which is, which is crazy. But you and I are paying for that, taxpayers' money. You know, rather than say, no, it's wrong, you know, we need to get you off this, we need to put you in a program, no, they'll just, they're just funding it. And, I, and I'm just tired, honestly, I'm just so tired. Um, so, you know, if, if you and I desire change this morning, not only in our own lives and in our own families, but in our villages, in our towns, in our cities, in our country, we need to get right with God. We really need to get right with God. And I guarantee you, God is waiting for us. God wants, we heard that God wants to deliver. Honestly, God wants to save, but he's waiting for you and I this morning. So if we're willing this morning, if, if my people, if my people, amen. Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. Father, we know that you are, you are ready to do a work um, with us in your church and in your land. But Father, it starts with us. Father, just help us this morning. Um, help us to accept um, the challenge. And Father, just help us to humble, himself, humble ourselves, um, pray and seek your face. And Father, help us to turn from our wicked ways. Father, help us to um, confess any unconfessed sin. Father, just help us to leave, um, lead clean lives. And Father, you, you said you will. You will heal our families. You will heal our land. And Father, we just thank you. We thank you that we can just um, rely on you. Father, you'll never leave us nor forsake us. So, Father, I just ask this morning that you just seal your word inside our hearts. Um, and, Father, we can just make a difference, make a change in these last days. Father, we know the time is short. And, Father, we just want to make a, a difference in these last days. So, Father, I just ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.